good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Oh. So between not having water and a time change, has this just not been the best weekend ever? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, no, man. We are absolutely, you got to have a sense of humor, don't you? Um, man, we're glad you're here, and uh, we're, 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 we're just thankful, right? We're blessed. You know, look, look, if our biggest problem is not having water three times in one week, we're still doing better than other people, right? Right. Amen. And God bless the aqueduct. Uh, those guys, you know, I got good friends that work there, and they are, they're, they're worn out. So, man, we, we'll pray for the aqueduct yeah. guys, and uh, just keep them in your prayers and everybody else. Would you stand with me, and let's worship the Lord. Father, we are so grateful for, uh, for, for the life you've given us, Lord. We're, no matter what, our, our problems are nothing compared to other people's, Father. We're so spoiled, and uh, we just want to give thanks to you, Father. Would you just inhabit our praises this morning and uh, just come and, 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 and be here? Just, we ask that you just dwell with us, God. We want to feel you. We want to be in your presence and uh, just accept our worship this morning. In your name, Father, everybody said amen. amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Thanks, Chad, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Oh, in every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name. Oh, and blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Oh, and blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. There's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Oh, in every blessing you pour out, I'll, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, you give and you take away, Lord you give and you take away. Heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and you take away. Lord, you give and you take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. Yeah. 
ocean, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Oh, and call back the sinner, and wake up the saint. Let every nation shout out your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, will be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come. Lord Jesus, come, and even so come, Lord Jesus, come, and there will be justice, all will be new, your name forever, faithful and true, Jesus is coming soon. Come waiting for her groom. We'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King. We sing, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. And even so come, Lord Jesus, come. So we wait. So we wait, Lord, we wait for you. Lord, we wait, cause you're coming soon. Lord, we wait, yes, we wait for you. Lord, we wait, cause you're coming Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be the church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus, come, and even so come, Lord Jesus. So come, Lord Jesus, come, oh, and even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Father, would you come?
are gone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your unending love, God. That your love is like a flood. Your mercies are like a flood. You know, the enemy wants to tarnish your worth, tarnish your identity, put doubts in your head. Were you really worthy? Does Jesus really call you his? Does he really love you like he says he loves you? I'm here to tell you right now that we can be our worst critics. I can be my worst critic. That my flesh, my sin nature wants to destroy me, wants to destroy my purpose, wants to destroy my calling. The same is for you, church. If you came in this morning, came in today, and the enemy, or yourself even, says, why are you coming into church? You know what you did yesterday. You know what you were thinking, how you were thinking. The sin that was in your heart. The things that maybe got you caught up. The Bible says if that we repent and if we ask for forgiveness, that his mercies renew every morning. So Jesus, we ask for your forgiveness. We repent, God. If there's anything in our hearts, Lord, that are keeping us from your identity, from your purpose, from, from your mission for us, God, we, we ask for that. Please forgive us, Lord Jesus, of any sin, any iniquity that has creeped into our hearts, Lord. We need you, Lord. We ask for that, God. We are sorry, God, that we missed the mark. But we are so thankful, God, that you call us still by name, that your mercy is renewed every morning, that you choose us in every day and every moment to be called for your purpose, to help people, to love people, to be your hands and your feet for this city, God. So thank you, Jesus, that your mercy is powerful, God, that we can be drowned in your mercy, that our sin nature... All the things that try to stand against us are drowning in your mercy. That they are put to death in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name at your cross. So let us sing this again, church, and be reminded that his mercy, his mercy has called you here. His mercy for you has restored you to the Father.
Welcome to New Life Church. Can we do a round of applause for Jesus? Listen, I know some of us haven't showered. Some of us <laughs> don't have any water, didn't get enough sleep. But come on, dig deep, church. If there's something in your heart that you're, is praiseworthy for Jesus, let's lift his name all high, right? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, you guys may be seated. Thank you for coming to New Life Church this morning, being here, and all of the craziness that is living in the Keys. Right? If cell phone towers aren't going down or roads are blocked or water is not happening, you know, we can still come together as a family and praise his name. Amen? Mm. All right, so we're going to get ready to do our tithes and offerings. So if the ushers want to come forward, please. <laughs> Thanks, you, mate. For those of us that uh, are not used to public praying, Jesus taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the power the power, and the kingdom forever. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to jump into some announcements here. Uh, just a quick reminder that today, after service at 1130, we are doing our Women's Second Sunday Fellowship Luncheon. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's a mouthful, right? But we have an amazing spread coming up. I saw a bunch of people bring in food, so there's, there should be some really good uh, food here for all, uh, all the women who are going to be able to join and do some fellowship, build a relationship with each other. Um, if you still want to come, it's not too late. You know, just go swing by public, get some, get some rolls, get some fried chicken or whatever. We'll make it happen, right? Uh, also, I wanted to have a quick uh, recap on, on our weekly events. If you can't read that, just ask me. <laughs> but but uh, Tuesday night, there was some confusion that, that was our Tuesday night chosen Bible study was last week, but I had just made the announcement last week, but that does actually start this Tuesday. So here, this Tuesday, in a few days, we're going to be launching the chosen Bible study. It's based on a pop, very popular TV show about Jesus and the disciples and all that fun stuff. I have not seen it, so selfishly, I'm super excited about going and checking it out finally in Jesus' name, right? So, and um, the producers have actually built a wonderful Bible study that goes with it. So that's going to be here on Tuesday night, every Tuesday night from 6 to 7.30. We're going to watch an episode. After the episode is over, we're going to discuss it, go through some questions, have some like, you know, Bible study time, small group time. So as we build out the small groups, um, that, this is a nice way, if this is something that you are completely foreign to, if you don't know about, if you don't know how to meet with people, you don't know how to do a Bible study. You don't know how to have an open discussion about God's word. This is a great on-ramp, all right, for you to have this soft approach, to be taught how to, what this kind of conversation looks like, what the environment looks like as we build out our small groups and get those ready. So it doesn't seem like such a shock to your spiritual system, right? Amen. <laughs> We're going to warm you up. Um, also, I wanted to have a quick announcement about the missionary family that, was, that had been with us here for a couple of weeks. Erica and Matt, and just as a reminder, Erica and Matt came to us solely through the Holy Spirit. Um, they are missionaries who travel around the country, really just as the Holy Spirit leads them, going to smaller churches who do not maybe have a, a praise and worship team or do not have the abilities or resources or volunteer structure in place to do sound design, production, all of the stuff you see John Robert do, do in the back booth here. That's the nerve center. We have cameras. We have all these musical instruments. We have soundboard mixing. All of this stuff requires a lot of skill sets and a lot of time to, to make the service what you see it today, um, including the videos and all this stuff, right? So... The Holy Spirit led them to us to be able to elevate us because this is not my giftings. All the stuff you see behind me, all the stuff that goes on in that booth, I'm not a musician. Um, and this is something that was all of the Holy Spirit moving to help elevate this church in a way that only he could. 
And so we're super grateful. They were able to help train our existing worship team, which I just want to say you guys did a killer job. You guys are doing amazing. So thank you so much for all those who came together and, and showing up to practices and being led and being teachable and um, really just believing and seeing what God wants to do on this stage and being examples of worship, not just your musicianship, but being an example of worship. So I thank you guys for carrying that. But yeah, so they had helped us tremendously. They helped train John Robert. Uh, Matt is actually a sound engineer and has a tremendous experience helping uh, you know, some mega churches with their sound design and all of that. And he's been a tremendous resource for us. And there, he, Matt is actually going to stay in relationship with us because he's just so floored about what the Holy Spirit's doing here at this church. And I, I think that's an amazing new friendship that we really have. I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a business relationship. I think it's a friendship. Uh, you know, God brought them here as family to us as a missionary to help them. And, you know, we were able to bless them last week. And we were able to raise almost $5,000 for them. I think that's huge. And they are, they are a missionary family. They, if, you, if you had a chance to talk with them, they sell their books, they sell CDs, they do gigs here and there, but they are solely dependent on generosity of churches and generosity of people sowing into them as missionaries across this country. So I, just, I think that's amazing for us. To me, it, it stirs something in me because missions is such a powerful piece of my heart that I got to see all of our generosity. Mm-hmm. Oh, wonderful. So Maria was saying that if you are interested in partnering with them and their mission, you can do monthly contributions. So I believe I think it's on Patreon or their website. Um, it's in the newsletter. So check out the newsletter. Uh, get connected with them if God so moves you to continually support them. All right, so we're going to go ahead and do our fellowship time. So let's all get up out of our seats. Let's get friendly. Let's do some high fives, hug some necks, all that fun stuff.
All right, everybody, let's, let's start working our way back to our seats, please. Everybody, if you guys wouldn't mind, as you make your way back to your seats, we're just going to go ahead and pray over today's message. So if you guys, please just bow your heads with me. Uh, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for who you are, Lord, that you are able to be in this church, that we can be receivers of your Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, that you speak through me, that um, all the things you have to say through me today, um, I would be submissive to, Lord, that you, you move me out of the way, that you use me as your mouthpiece, that all the things that you have for this church, it is your church, God and that we can be honored to call to it, honored to be on the same team, honored to be building together and loving on this city intentionally. And we just thank you, Lord Jesus, that you chose us for this time, that you chose us for now, uh, chose us to all be here today with, with no water and maybe no showers, you know, all that stuff, that we can still come together in this place and find, find things to glorify your name, find things to be uh, thankful for. So we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, good morning, New Life Church. How are we? A little smelly? A little thirsty? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, excellent. Well, today what we're going to be doing, we're going to be kicking off uh, a little fun little new series that I'm doing. It's actually going to be bookended around Easter. So it's called Heart for the House. So Heart for the House is really, you know, when I've been praying about what I, what, how I see us entering into Easter is I want to make sure that we can know what God's heartbeat is for this house, this church, that this is his house, this is his dwelling place, that we are a family, we are many members, we are diverse, we are colorful, we are all different things, and we are coming together for our Father's vision, for his purposes in this house. And so when, we, when we're going to be launching today is going to be the first piece of that. Like, what, God, what is your heart beat? And then we're going to start a new sermon series, and I'll, and I'll tease it just a little bit, called Good News People. And we're going to, that's going to be, how are we reflections of the gospel? As we get ready for Easter, we can be reflecting on our own hearts, reflecting what does it mean to be people who are living out the gospel? Going into Easter and having that amazing experience, a lot of times we can, we can almost emotionally manipulate ourselves about Easter, because it's the first time we take a second to actually be still with Jesus. But I want us to be ready, be mature, be sober-minded as we enter into that conversation about Easter and what it really means, that it doesn't just have to be an Easter conversation, amen? That we can carry that gospel with us. And as we cool down from Easter, we're going to be talking about those implications. How, how do we keep living this way? How do we keep living off of that uh, experience that of who Jesus is and what he's called to. And then we're going to finalize this sermon series with part two at the end of that. So part two of Heart for the House will come after Easter. So in, in this beginning, you know, really, really meditating with God, really trying to focus my heart with, or I should say aligning my heart with his heart, is what, is what is all of this for, right? And you guys have probably heard me say this more than once, but why are we even here? Is it all just for us to be here and have a couple snacks, have some really shallow, superficial conversations? How was your week? How was this? How's work? Blah, blah, blah. You know, you look nice. This is cool. Boat stuff, blah, blah, blah. Fishing, blah, blah, blah. Restaurant, blah, 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 blah. It's all a bunch of noise, right? Why are we really here? What is church? What is Jesus? What is the gospel? What does salvation really mean? And what is God's heart? What does his word have to say about what all of this is for? Because if all we do is just gather and nod and throw a couple of amens out there, are we really doing the mission that we were sent after, that God called us for? We weren't called to just be saved, right? God didn't just say, yes, you are my son. I wrote your name in my book. You would now have salvation. You now have life eternally in heaven, and that's good. And then the rest of our lives, we only serve at the, at, at the altar of ourselves. 
Just because I got my golden ticket, I got my golden heaven ticket, now I'm good, now I can go back to doing what I need to do for me because I know I'm cool now. I got my eternal punch card, I got my VIP membership to heaven, I don't have to worry about nothing. Is that the gospel? Is that what it's really about? So let's dig in and see what God's words has to say. Let's go to Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Prophetic vision. All the last six weeks, we went through this whole sermon series called The Path. Keeping your head up. Locking your eyes to Jesus. Realizing that the path we are on should be all leading to Jesus, right? That is the path. I think about the highway right here and the, the, the crazy people in Florida, man, like coming, coming from Colorado, we have like a 55, 60 speed limit, you know, maybe 10, maybe 15 over, people push it. But literally, I'll be on the highway, dude, and people are punching 90, 95, just woo, 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 woo. I'm like, what is Florida about? Like, what is going on here? And it's just like, it doesn't matter the vehicle either. I thought it was just, you know, hot rods. But it's like, dude, commercial vans running 95 miles an hour, people in their minivans just blazing past me. I'm like, oh. I thought I had a lead foot, man. Like, you Florida people are crazy, dude. Uh, Maybe it's just Miami. I don't know, dude, but it it gets wild up there. But I think about about that, right? Like, the the path that we are on are highways. We, We know this path that we are on. But if we think about the highways that we drive on, the only thing that keeps us from from a fatal situation are a couple painted lines and a couple strips of aluminum on the side. That's it. Otherwise, we're zipping past people. You know, you flip on your blinker, a little light shines and does all this, but there's not a lot that keeps us safe. But I think about this scripture is that when we are on this path, that we are running headlong towards God, that we have to have these guard rails up, that we have to have restraint. Otherwise, if we didn't have the lines, if we didn't have these guard rails up about what is the real vision, what is the mission it's real easy to be on that path and lose the sight. Get us, you know, start swerving here and there. Now you're in somebody else's lane. You're not even paying attention. All these things are happening, and you endanger yourself. So when we lose the vision, when we forget what the actual mission of this church is, all we're doing is getting saved and just living to serve ourselves. Jesus said that he is your Lord, period. Lord of your life, as soon as, you, as soon as you said, Jesus, I need you, I'm broken, I'm sinful, the wages of all of this stuff is going to lead me on a path to hell. I need your salvation. Come save me. He became the Lord of everything in your life for all of your life. Let me say that again. He became the Lord of your life for all of your life. So it's not just when you're at church. It's like, God, God, what is your mission? What is your purpose? What is your, how, do, how do I align everything I do for the mission of your church? What was this whole point? Why did you come to me on that day, on that night, at this place, and spoke to me through your word, or spoke to me through this person, or spoke to me through this song, and chose me by name? Why did you come? Why did you come and encounter me? Why did you choose me? Was it just so I could be cleaned up? Was it just so I could have the appearance of a Christian? Was it just so I had somewhere to go for an hour a week? What is your mission for me, God? We don't know the mission unless we catch the vision. Amen? Otherwise, we're going to be swerving all around. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That is Jesus speaking. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, and he went, behold, two men stood by him in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you in heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I really want us to focus 
on verse 8. So I'm going to read that again. Verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So from Jesus' own mouth, he called us to be witnesses. If there is ever a mission statement, if anybody's ever been in corporate world, you have a mission statement, right? Everybody who's in that business, who's in that company, can align themselves with that mantra, whether it's somebody who's in the mailroom or the CEO or other executives or leads or anything like that. The mission statement is something that everybody rallies behind for a unified purpose and vision of what this company is all about. So if we think about this church, if we think about God's business, what is God's business? Is his mission statement is that we would be witnesses. It's not that you can, so that you can come to church. Not, that, not even so that you would be saved. Is that so that we would be witnesses. So I was doing some studies about what does it even mean to be a witness. You know, there's different things that we talk about using that word. It could be in the, in the courtroom, right? There's witnesses, there's prosecutors, there's a jury, all this stuff. And you have a witness who swears on God's word under his authority that everything they say is truthful under perjury of law and consequences. We also have historical witnesses. You know, there's a lot of people who I've talked to here who have been through hurricanes here, and they have a historical story to tell. Like, I was here at Irma. I saw this happen. I saw these damages. You know, they had, they had an eyewitness account of some of the historical events that took place in that city. And we also have witness protection. You know, when somebody gives an account for something to such a degree that truth, the value of truth is bigger than the value of their own life. So I think, think about that in the context of the secular world. How when you have people who are being prosecuted against, criminals or different things, and you have witnesses showing up, and somewhere in their conscious, whether it be their own conscious or the move of the Holy Spirit, I don't know, but to something that moves them to such a strong conviction that they want to seek after truth and being a witness of that truth to such a level that they are unafraid of the consequences. And the government has formed a protection program to help people and protect their families. So I think about that, like why is it when we talk about witnessing that we can only really think of the context of it after the witnessing happens? Like only does the identity of the witness come to fruition after you have opened your mouth. You don't know what kind of witness you are until after you've opened your mouth. The things that follow, whether it be a historical recount or be a criminal witness or a witness of certain events or any of these things, nothing happens, no identity, no context happens until you open your mouth. So when we have this statement from Jesus saying that you will be my witnesses, if we never open our mouth, we're not a witness. It's not coming to church that makes you a witness. It's opening your mouth and declaring to others and saying, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about how I conquered depression, how I conquered addiction, how the Holy Spirit moved through me to heal my families, to heal my marriage, to save my business, to give me something, to to create a testimony. Let me witness to the moment where I saw God move in such a way that he interrupted And shattered my entire reality. He shattered my identity. He shattered all of these things in my life. Let me witness. Let me tell you. Let me proclaim. Let me shout. Let me explain to you what God has done. And only then can we be considered a witness. I was doing a word study on the word witness. And the Greek word for it. I'm going to butcher this, so if anybody speaks Greek, I apologize. Uh, it's martus. Martus. Bless you. <laughs> martus. It comes from the word martyr. 
Man, that hit me in the stomach when I read that. Hard. Hard. If anybody who doesn't know what a martyr is, I, I suggest you read the book, Jesus Freaks. That, that'll completely shatter your entire vision and, and ideal of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a witness. So that book is a compilation of countless people, Jesus time, Bible times, all through current history, of who so proclaimed Jesus and their testimony and the salvation and godhood of Jesus to such high levels that most of them died. But dying was the easy part. A lot of them faced torture, horrid stuff, horrid things, and they never once backed down from their testimony, their verbal testimony from being a witness and proclaiming Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I think about that today, right now in this moment. Like all of you who came to church chose to proclaim Christ in your actions, chose to proclaim Christ coming to church. Even though it was uncomfortable, you didn't have a shower, you didn't have water. Maybe some of you have kids and if they were thirsty or having issues and you couldn't give them a bath, you couldn't give them something to eat. You didn't get enough sleep. They didn't get enough sleep. But you chose to, in that discomfort, profess that Jesus is Lord and he is worth it. But why is it that sometimes that's, that's all, it, that's all it, it, it doesn't go any further than that? Why, why do we have to be stuck in such a place where when we think about witnessing, when we think about proclaiming Jesus, that if we think about it as being martyrs, that we would go to the extremes of death because everything we have is a gift. The air I breathe is a gift. The family I have is a gift. My salvation is a gift. My resources are a gift. They are not mine anymore. I have been nailed to the cross. Everything that I was was nailed to the cross and put to death so that he may live inside of me. So why is it that instead of witnessing, I keep my mouth shut because it makes me uncomfortable? Because I don't want to be embarrassed. Because I don't want to be aligned with some political version or some other label of what it is to be a Christian. Because it's uncomfortable. But the Bible says that your mission is to witness. Is to open your mouth. But we don't want to do that. Let me ask you a question. What does it mean for you in your own walk to witness about Jesus? Do you feel like you're living up to that? Do you feel like you are really a witness? Or are you just a spectator? Did you get your golden ticket and you kind of coasting spiritually? Or are you looking for places and people and situations to go into to proclaim his gospel. Because that's the mission field, right? Think about who Jesus was. He was on a mission to save your soul. He didn't do it apathetically. He didn't do it when, he, when it was convenient for him. He did it because his father asked him to, because that was his mission. That was the whole purpose. And he sought you out intentionally, on purpose, Exactly at the time that you needed that conversation to happen, that interaction to happen, that move of his heart that interrupted everything that you had built around yourself, he came and sought you out. But it's our responsibility to do the exact same thing with others. That we can have the eyes of Christ, that we can have the heart of Christ, to be moved to such a place that when God puts people in our lives, whether it's in the parking lot, at Publix, on the fishing boat, at work, at school, at the bank, whatever it is, that is your mission field. You are called for such a time as this to proclaim and to witness and to testify to the goodness and the glory and the mercy and the wonderful experiences and the hope and the future that you have with Jesus. Not just here at church when we're all coming together and saying the name of Jesus is safe and celebrated, but going out there and doing it. When maybe it's not safe, maybe it's not celebrated, maybe it's going to be uncomfortable, maybe it's not going to be something that, that you enter into easily, but that is the mission.
That is the purpose. Let's go back to the scripture, 1 8, Acts 1 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So when I was reading this, I was thinking about that mission field, right? Missionaries, all these things, the fact that we were blessed by a missionary family. And what God has for this church, what what the vision is for this church, why here? Why in the middle of Marathon? Why now? Why are so many people coming to this church from every place geographically? Pennsylvania, Maryland, Canada, California. I I mean, every state is represented at one point in time under this roof. Why? Because this is a mission field. God has called us to serve and proclaim his gospel. So when I was thinking about this scripture, it's really easy to be like, oh yeah, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, the ends of the earth. Yeah, we get it, like missions. Missions are important, moving on. But when I think about this scripture, I think the the thing that convicts me is that I think we oftentimes flip it around. We start with the ends of the earth because it's a lot easier as consumers to just go and throw money at something that's really far away and say, oh, this, you know, this international ministry or this thing going over, or Uganda or blah, 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 is cool. I'm going to go throw money at it, and I did my thing as a Christian, and I'm done. Or maybe you go on an actual missions trip, and I have never been on one, but I've heard the stories. You know, you take your time, you go, you, you're with the people and all this stuff, and you do missions, and you sleep on a dirt floor, or you don't get a shower, you don't have water, you... You basically pretend to feel what they're feeling in that moment. But we have to be honest, you're coming back to a house. You're coming back to a job. You're coming back to food on the table, three meals a day. You're coming back to electricity. You're coming back to running water. You get the privilege to come back. So think about that. I think about that often is why why do we have to go on a missions trip? to turn our cell phone off, to position our hearts in such a way that we can stop seeing people as just numbers and be actually human beings and be moved by compassion. Why is it that we have to go 10,000 miles across the world to be used by God? It's because we don't want to interrupt our lives. We don't want to interrupt what we're trying to do. So I think about these scriptures, this scripture, where it says Jerusalem, you know, Marathon is our Jerusalem. I don't care if if you're only here for a week or if you've been here for 30 years. If this is your city, you're here, wherever God puts your feet, that is your mission field. So if this is your home, this is your home church, Marathon is where God has called you. He has called me here. I have no idea about this city. (laughs) My wife grew up here, cool. But I have no idea. This to me is a mission field. I'm in the middle of the Caribbean on a rock, literally three hours from mainland. Well, two, you know, depending on traffic, but anyway. You know, depending if, you know, I'm driving like 90 miles an hour. Anyway. This, to me, feels like a mission field. There, there is such a subculture here that I'm still trying to figure out. The way things are done, the flow, the, the relationship dynamics, the, the intricacies of what it means to even be in the Keys, be in Marathon. This is a unique place. And to me, I feel like I'm in a foreign land. I have no idea what's going on. But all I know is that God has called me for such a time as this and that I want to be a part of it. So when when you leave this church, I pray that you can be sensitive, that the Holy Spirit can move in such a way that you would realize that this just isn't a regular town. It's the town that God has put you in. That there are people literally five minutes down the road at the Seafood Festival who are in desperate need of the message of Christ, who are in desperate need of a witness moment, 
who are in desperate need to have Jesus interrupt their situation and have salvation be poured out on them, have hope be poured out on them, to have an actual human-to-human human, uh, human interaction so that they can be seen and heard. The keys is our Judea. This is more than just one city. You know, I have people constantly tell me about the keys, the keys, the keys, the keys, right? It's, it's just this word. You know, it's like, yeah, United States, and then we have the keys. You know, no, seriously, it's like, you know, you got United States, you have the keys, you have Puerto Rico. It's like, it's like, so that ownership mentality, that like, that idea of like, yeah, man, you don't understand, it's the keys, this is how things get done, this is marathon, blah, blah, blah. Like, what? <laughs> I, I want us to be able to take that narrative and flip it around because a lot of times people tell me about this city and about, like, oh, yeah, like all these people coming in, it's super frustrating, or the traffic, or there's, you know, all these issues about, you know, people buying up vacation rentals and VRBOs and, you know, things like that. And I, and I am thinking through it as, as a foreigner, right, as somebody who didn't grow up here that doesn't have those sensitivities. And I'm like, well, why is God bringing more people here? Why is God crowding Marathon? Why is he pulling more people here from everywhere across the country? Why are you here today? Why is God using this church as a beacon, as, a, as an, a, something that is attracting people from all over the country? I went to this thing at a, a Chamber of Commerce meeting where they said literally tourism has almost, I think, more than doubled in the last two years. Over four million people come to the Keys annually. Four million people. It was less than two million a couple years ago. Why has that happened? Yes, tourism. Yes, this. All this. But that's the earthly definition. That's the, that's the secular definition. God, what are you working on? What are you doing here? How can I align myself with your mission? How can I start seeing this as opportunity instead of inconvenience? Let me say that again. How can I start having eyes to see this is an opportunity to be used by you instead of an inconvenience that disrupts my comfort. Whether it be traffic or parking or these different things. God, how are you going to use me here in this city? What can I start doing to align myself with what you're trying to do in this city? Luke chapter 10 verses 30 through 37 is the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to paraphrase it because we're short on time. But basically, it's the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told uh, one of the people he was interacting with. And Samaria had a long history of being at war with the Jews. Long history. So in this verse, when it talks about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, I was really thinking about, like, who is our biggest enemy? You know, it could easily, you could easily attach some political label to that, some other religion label. But if we're being honest, and I'm, and I'm being really honest, I feel like I am my biggest enemy of that. Because in this culture, the things that keep me from being a witness are me in my position of godhood over my own life. Because I want to do what I want to do on my time, with my money, my resources, my intellect, because I deserve it. Even though we profess that Jesus is Lord and we celebrate him, we clap and we say, yes, Lord, your cross, everything from you, God, everything from you. But all of your thoughts, all of your money, all of your intentions, all of your ideals, everything focuses on you. How do I make me comfortable? How do I make my life better? How do I bring myself? How do I elevate myself? Think about this, the social media dynamic that happens. Let me put pictures of what I'm doing. Let me take snaps. Let me put some profound words so everybody can celebrate me and my intelligence. Or don't you know who I am? Don't you know who I know? Don't you know what I've done in my life? How many degrees I have? How successful my businesses are? How much money I have? Or how shrewd I am as an investor? Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? All we want to talk about is ourselves. All we want to celebrate is ourselves. All we want to witness to is how good we are. 
at how many followers we are and how many worshipers we have. Oh, come on, church. We don't want to use this language now, do we, huh? But let's be real honest with ourselves. If you were so consumed with Jesus the way you are about yourself, we wouldn't even need to be talking about witnessing. If all you wanted to do was lift his name on high, how do I get Jesus more followers? How do I lift his name about my marriage or my success or use all the things that I have to glorify him, to let others know that he is the hope, the truth, the life instead of you? How do we fade into the background? We are our own worst enemies. We want to be the gods of our life. We are the enemies that come in and steal the throne away from God. And it's easy to justify. And it's really easy to be comfortable in it because the American dream is so wrapped up in your dream and what you get out of it. And I think this for me is a very humbling and convicting moment. And I pray that you can receive these words out of love and mercy and grace. That you have a tender heart. Holy Spirit, we pray for a tender heart, Lord. We pray that you would soften us. That if conviction flows, it's not out of guilt or condemnation, God. But it's so that you may prune us. That you may stir our soil. That you may water us, Lord God. So that we can be receiving and repent and ask for forgiveness, God. So that we can truly live like you are lords of our life. Fully and completely. Not just on a Sunday morning. So I pray that if there's anything in your life that you have idols in your life, if you have things that you have so built around your life that only point to you as being the one who should receive the glory, in Jesus' name, you need to tear those down. You need to repent, and you need to tear those down. Because none of that stuff stays with us. You can't take anything with you. Whatever that means for you, I don't know, but I know that you do. And the Holy Spirit is talking to you right now. And you need to listen because we do not need to get in his way. If we're truly going to be witnesses, we need to start, stop elevating ourselves above Jesus. And whatever that means for you, you need to act upon it. You need to do it. You need to be receiving of the Holy Spirit because it's only through him. Let's go to Acts 1.8 again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. So you're asking yourself, John, how do I do this, man? Like, yes, I get it. I'm convicted. Who? Boom, hit me in the chest, but what do I do? How do I, how do I actually do this? What does it mean to be a witness? How do I go in front of people at my work? How do I get through that comfort or discomfort or social anxiety? Or, man, like, help me, what do I do? And it all comes from the first part. It says, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit who has come. It is only through the Holy Spirit, not your ideals, not a good book, not some scripture, not anything, not my words, not your best friend's words. It's only through the Holy Spirit, through his Holy Spirit, that we can be filled as a vessel so that we can, once full, we can pour out to those who are thirsty. It is not meant for us to be full and put a lid on it and say, cool, my jar is full. Look how wonderful it is. Let me polish it up. No, it becomes stagnant and undrinkable. It's not for us to drink either. The things that God fills us up for is so that we can witness and we can pour out to a thirsty land. So what is he doing? He wants you to ask for the Holy Spirit. So say this with me, church. Holy Spirit, come. Again, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. More, come on. Holy Spirit, come. Say it like you mean it. Holy Spirit, come. God, we need you. We need you. Jesus, we need you. Holy Spirit, we need you. 
Fill us, God. Pour out on us. We are a thirsty, thirsty people, Father. We need you, Jesus. We need to be able to be full by you, that you give us your giftings. You give us the character of your heart, God, so that we can be compassionate. We can be bold, that we can go out into this land, wherever it may be, at Publix or anywhere else that you call us in Marathon, Jesus, that we can, we can be so moved so that our life is a life of purpose. Our life is a life that blazes and burns bright with your, your hope and your salvation and your message of, of truth and mercies for the people who need you the most, God. Let us not be stagnant. Let us not be apathetic in your message, God, that we can seek after you, Lord Jesus, that we can run towards you so much that, God, we are drifted into the background, that we melt away, that is no longer us. It is no longer our successes or our resources, God. It is fully through you and only through you, Lord Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. So we lift our hands and we say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. More of you. More of you. Burn us out, God. More of you, Holy Spirit. We need you. We need you. This city needs you, God. This city is desperate for you, God. The aches and pains, God. The, the sorrow, the hardship, God. The hurt, God. We we need you. We need your Holy Spirit. We need you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It's not by us, church, and it shouldn't be. Break that idol down. You're not that cool. You're not that smart. You're not that funny. <laughs> it's only through the Holy Spirit and the salvation message of Jesus. So that's the, that's the vision, that's the heartbeat of New Life Church, is that we can be a church of missions, not just giving money to people who are 10,000 miles away, but we would be a church that is activated by his Holy Spirit so that we can see this is the mission field, that we can see our neighbor people who help us with our yard, people that we see at Publix, whatever it may be, you understand what I'm saying, whatever it may be, whoever it may be, whenever it may be, that we can see that as a divine opportunity to witness and glorify and break our thrones down for his name, Jesus' name, that we can love and see purpose. And what is this about? Activate us, Lord. Give us the boldness. Worship team, if you guys will come up. So what does that mean, right? <laughs> There's something that I want to work on. I mean, that, well, I should say uh, that God has put in my heart to work on and there's some really fun things that the board and I are going to put together in regards to how do we build strategic teams around mission-minded people. Because the mission starts at the house. The true mission starts here. And a part of that mission field is what you see here today. What hap what's happening on the other side of that door. What's happening in that booth with John, Robert, and Carlos. What happens every Sunday night at youth group is that this is where the mission starts, at this house. And we're going to be building out what's called dream teams. Teams of people who help us build the dream of this house, of what God is doing here at New Life Church. Because I am not the person that you should be looking for for all of the answers, all the solutions. It's what are we doing? What are you doing to help build this? I think it's really easy to spectate. It's really easy from a spectating seat to be critical of the actions of others and saying, oh, you should have done it this way, or oh, you should have done it that way. I didn't like this. I didn't like that. When we should say, how can I serve? How can I be a part of this? If there's something that you feel you can do better, amen, raise your hand. Let's be a part of this. Let's do it better. better. But it's, it's in a church that catches that mission that things like that happen. And so building the dream team is really just a way for us to say, how can we all build this together? 
Not just the same five people that you see every Sunday behind me, right? Like this right here is a move of God. A move of God. God has done this. Amen. But we have to be intentional with how do we do more of this so that you guys don't get burnt out, so that you can be fulfilled, so that you can have a place to call home, that you are knowing that it's not just your musical abilities, it's what's the purpose God has put in your heart, the mission, so that as you profess worship, as you profess his praise, you know that you are, you are shattering chains, that you are shattering generational curses, that we are going out and doing something powerful, that what happens on the other side of this door in kids' church is amazing and profound and that kids are coming to Christ and kids are learning about Jesus and children are embarking on a new and exciting relationship with God so the enemy does not have a foothold in their young hearts. That's what Dream Teams is all about, is giving us opportunities to build this house, to be a part of it and not just spectate about it. So these are some teasers that we're looking at. So, so be prayerfully considering these. So the first ones is, is our kids' crew. Kids' crew is kids' church. And I say kids' church, I don't say babysitting. I don't say daycare. It's very important that you understand the difference. Because for me as a father, I don't want a babysitter. I want somebody who's preaching at my son. I want somebody who's teaching him scriptures and helping him memorize scriptures, who is allowing him to be in a praise and worship environment so that he can have a relationship with Jesus, so that he can have a relationship with his Holy Spirit. That's kids' church. So everything you see happening on a Sunday, God is going to build for those kids. They're going to have their own worship team. They're going to have teachers. They're going to have preachers. They're going to have Bible studies. They're going to have everything we have here because the same Holy Spirit lives in, in them as it does in us. And just because they're younger doesn't mean they can't understand the depths and truths of God's word. Amen? Other one was welcome team. So the welcome team is our first impression to our community. And I don't know about you, but I, have you ever come into someone's home and they don't shake your hand, they don't greet you, they don't offer you a hug or something to drink, how cold and distant that makes you feel. I, I've come from a place where as you enter into someone's home and how you treat them is the most important thing. To love them, to, to offer them something, offer them a blanket or, or slippers or you know anything at all to, to make them feel as, as comfortable and as welcome and as accepted and as loved as humanly possible. So we're going to be building out that team of, you know, parking lot attendants, people, greeters, follow-up teams so that when people come to church, they're followed up with and having lunch and all of these things so people can feel like they are actually a part of something and they didn't just show up, hit their punch card and leave. Amen? And then our worship team. This is amazing. Like I said, this is a move of God. But these people cannot be the same people over and over again. They need to have breaks. They need to go to church. They need to have time to be ministered to. So we want to keep building that team, providing more opportunities for people and their giftings to come up here and celebrate what God's doing through them as a worshiper. We also have our tech team. So back there we have Carlos and John Robert, but there's a lot that goes into that. These cameras, the sound, the, the mixing of sound, the lights, the slides, our live streaming, all of this, there's so many pieces of it, and we have barely scratched the surface, so we need, we're going to need more help. So if that's something that you want to prayerfully consider, there'll, be, there'll come a time, okay? And then finally, our hospitality team. So hospitality is everything you see over there, right? Food and coffee and having fellowship dinners and having fun hot dog events with blow up, uh, bounce houses and all this stuff. Like, you know, us doing family with each other, being hospitable. That's, that's a gifting. I have no idea how to, do, how to do like big events. That's my wife, like decorations and all this stuff. Like, I just know how it feels good, but I don't know how to actually plan it. Event planning is a divine gift. So <laughs> if anybody's ever done one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So that is what we're, we're believing for. And we're going to work out the kinks, cast a bigger vision, get all these teams and, and team leaders built around that. You know, like I said, me and the board are going to be working on this. But we want to have opportunities for all of us to partner in this big mission together. 
because it, it is important. So closing remark here that I have for you guys is I pray that the Holy Spirit has been moving in you today so that you can be a person of action and not inaction. Because I think for us and myself, it can, it can be really easy to just like, you know, someone else will do that, Pastor John. Everything I just said, you tuned out, and you're like, yeah, somebody else is going to do that. That's not me. You know, I got my thing, and I'm my thing, this, my thing, that. I don't, I don't like kids. I don't like technology. I don't, li- I don't play a guitar. I don't like moving chairs. I don't like chopping oranges. I don't like, I don't like, I don't like. Because somebody else is going to do it. Well, if you have that selfish mentality, nobody's going to do it. And why are you here if it's not to do the mission? Everything I've just been preaching about. And I can't get you to move some chairs. I can't get you to chop some oranges. Come on, church. Be, let us be a church of action, of proactive action. So that we know the mission field is ripe. 20, 30,000 people out there. I'm sure most of them don't know who Jesus is. Otherwise, this church should be full. Right? So there's people right now, I know you can think of probably at least 20 people who don't know Jesus. So we don't have a shortage of people. We don't have a shortage of opportunities. But it starts here. It starts right here. Just saying, hey, yeah, I'm busy. I got all these other things. But let's figure it out, Pastor John. I can't show up every, every week. Cool. I don't want you to show up every week. But I do want you to show up and be a part of this. So let us be a church of action. Let us be a church so motivated and full and filled by his Holy Spirit that we can actually be doing church, not just spectating. Amen? Holy Spirit, we thank you, God. We thank you so much for what you're doing here, for your conviction, for for your authority in our lives, Lord, that we can be submissive to you, Lord Jesus, that we can recognize when we need to bow down we can recognize when we need to trash our idols god that we can recognize that you are calling us of your divine mission statement god that we are on a mission this mission is alive and well to this day it's not just some old suggestion from 2,000 years ago that this is an active mission that we be witnesses to such a point that we can be putting ourselves to death putting our ideals to death We can be breaking down everything that we thought was important so that it can be put to death in Jesus' name so that you may live, you may be glorified, your name may be exalted. So give us that fresh inpouring of your Holy Spirit. More of you, Holy Spirit. More of you. In Jesus' name. All right, if you guys rise to your feet. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. Here we go. You're the everlasting. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak, and you comfort those in need. And you lift us up on wings like here we go. Strength will rise. The strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. And you do not faint, you won't. 
grow weary. You're the defender of the weak, and you comfort those in need, and you lift us up on wings like eagles. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you and give you the glory for everything that you've done here today. Lord, I ask that each and every one of us would leave here different than the way we walk through these doors. Lord, would you just move in our hearts, move in our minds, Lord? Father, I pray that you bring people in front of our paths, that we cross paths with people by your divine appointment this week, Lord, that we would be a witness. Lord, that we could just show you to them, Father. Lord, it doesn't have to be anything extravagant. Lord, we may not even know we're doing it. But that's not the point. The point is, is that we're just obedient. We open our mouth when you move us to open our mouth. We do something kind when you move us to do something kind. Lord, it's just that simple. In your precious name, Father, go with each and every one of us, Lord. May we go in peace. May we go in safety. Lord, we're going to have friends of ours that are here for the winter that are going to start to go home, God. And for those of us that are, those that are going to be leaving us, Father, I pray that you would just give them traveling mercies. Keep them safe and bring them back safely next year, Father. May they go in good health and in blessings. Father, we pray all this in your precious name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign for.